devil. This is the most dangerous dirt bike of all time. It's supposed to be the scariest, the wildest, and the most menacing motocrosser ever made. And today, we're gonna take it for a rip. So let's see if I can survive the ride. The 1971 Suzuki TM400 Cyclone has a reputation like no other. It became a legend for all the wrong reasons. But before we dive headfirst, quite literally, into all of the problems that made this the most feared steed in the world, let's first jump in our time machine and head back to 1970 to set the scene for the arrival of our ferocious 400. Picture this, it's 1970 and a new decade is upon you. Flared jeans and big collars rule the world. The summer of 69 has just been and gone and there's a distinct whiff of change in the air, in all aspects of life. And in the dirt bike world, this changing of the guard is about to be felt at scramble meets, desert races and professional events all over the globe. Up until 1970, Grand Prix motocross was totally dominated by European manufacturers. It's hard to imagine now in present day, but back then the Japanese weren't even considered competition. They just didn't seem that bothered at all by their relatively new sport of motocross. That was true at least until Suzuki came along. From 1954, when the 500cc World Motocross Championship first began, up until 1970, no Japanese manufacturer had claimed motocross gold at the Grand Prix level. In fact, before 1968, the Japanese were pretty much non-existent in the sport. In those early years, a litany of small European manufacturers climbed their Everest and achieved eternal glory. Manufacturers such as AJS, FN, Monarch, Norton, Greaves and BSA will live on forever in the annals of motocross history as world championship winning brands. Although many of these brands would only actually win one title before slipping away into obscurity in the following years. In the pre-1970 motocross era, there were two real giants of the sport. Czechoslovakian brand CZ won seven world titles between 1964 and 1969 and the Swedish firm Husqvarna dominated the competition, winning 10 world titles between 1959 and 1970. But these giants were about to be swept away by the first wave of the Japanese invasion that Suzuki were about to lead. In 1968, Suzuki released the TM250, which was the first real Japanese machine in the motocross game. And Swedish rider Oli Peterson rode for Suzuki in the 250cc World Championships in 1968 and 1969. But with the dawn of the new decade, Suzuki were ready to really step up their off-road operation. For the 1970 GP season, Suzuki were able to acquire the services of the reigning 250cc World Champion, Joel Robert, tempting him away from CZ. Robert would go on to win his fourth world championship that year, making Suzuki the first Japanese manufacturer to ever win a motocross world title. The rest, as they say, is history. Over the next 15 years, Suzuki would win 21 world championships across all three classes. They came, they saw, they conquered. The 1971 was a monumental year for motocross for a multitude of reasons. Firstly, the iconic On Any Sunday film was released in cinemas, meaning that Steve McQueen and co would inspire a whole new generation of riders to get involved in dirt bike sport. Secondly, Suzuki would play the same trick on CZ again as they stole Roger da Costa away from the Czechoslovakian brand after he had just finished third in the 1970 250cc World Championship. This would create one of the most legendary pairings in the sport's history and Roger was ready to step up into the big boy class for the new season. 
And finally, in 1971, Suzuki unveiled their very first open-class Big Four two-stroke machine. It was this, the TM400 Cyclone. Oh yeah, and our resident test rider, Sean Smith, was also born in 1971. What a truly monumental year for the sport. The release of this bike was perhaps the most anticipated unveiling the sport had ever seen. And from what I've read, Suzuki spared no expense in making sure that it was an event to be remembered. In a bid to impress the burgeoning American market and prove that this bike was the future and show that Suzuki were willing to go boldly where no man had been before, the TM400 Cyclone was unveiled to the press for the very first time on the lot of Warner Brothers Studios in Hollywood, California, and the event was hosted by none other than Captain Kirk himself, William Shatner of Star Trek fame. The captain assured the onlooking, and you'd have to assume rather impressed media scrum, that this production bike was as close to factory machinery as feasibly possible. Suzuki were obviously confident that they'd built a real winner here. The tagline for many of the marketing posters read, for $1,000 you can now beat any motocross racer ever made. The hype was real. Suzuki had done an awesome job at marketing this machine. In 1971, the Suzuki factory bikes were generally seen as being the best machines there were, miles ahead of the European competition. Suzuki had also hired two genuine superstars in Da Costa and Robert to ride and win for them. And when that all added together, Suzuki were able to pretty much successfully convince the entire world that the TM400 Cyclone would be just as good as Roger Da Costa's 1971 World Championship winning RH400 factory machine. So the Cyclone was built to be, or at least look like, a replica of the works machine of the day. The bike was powered by a 396cc single cylinder two-stroke motor with oil injection, so there's no need for premix here. And for the time, this engine really did pack a punch, pumping out 40 horsepower at 6,500 RPM. That might not sound that impressive today, but back then in the 70s, with drum brakes and twin shocks, that was fast, real fast. Upon release, the suspension was considered to be pretty good. As you can see, we've got these long telescopic, hydraulically damped forks at the front, and of course, those twin shocks at the back. Our bike here is sporting the original exhaust system, which is about as rare as hen's teeth for flying pigs. You just don't see these around anymore, but this, original exhaust system here on our bike. The bike is 2,160 millimeters long, it's 875 millimeters wide, and 1,135 millimeters tall, and it weighed 105 kilograms dry. The wheels were aluminium, and the overall look and styling of the bike really turned heads back in the day, and even now, it's a stunning bike to look at. One of the main talking points that Suzuki were very excited about was the pointless electronic ignition system. In their eyes, they were bringing dirt bikes into the future and eliminating the awkward and difficult process of timing adjustment. The bike is air-cooled and has a five-speed gearbox. And if you see right here, you can see it's actually got two spark plugs in there. Now, when it came new back in the day, this second spark plug was actually a decompressor to make starting easier, obviously. And we actually do have one of those, an original decompressor from 1971. So what they would do back in the day, they felt that they didn't need the decomp, so they put the second spark plug in, and if the first one failed or fouled, they'd take the spark plug cap, pop it on the second one, and they'd be ready to roll once again. As you can see, this bike is an absolute beauty. A real specimen and probably the best example of a TM400 Cyclone that we could possibly hope to show you guys. After all, it is a 52, nearly 53 year old machine. Usually for videos like this one, when we're riding, reviewing and talking about a rare or interesting bike, we typically send the word out to our awesome viewers that we're looking for a specific machine or we ask our friends in the industry to help us out to find a bike to borrow for a day of filming. People love to share the stories of their bikes after all. But for a bike this age and apparently this dangerous, we just couldn't find anyone anywhere that knew the whereabouts of a TM400 Cyclone that we could borrow and use for a day of filming. And to be honest, 
I wasn't too sure that I really wanted to ride and potentially crash someone's 50 year old pride and joy. So we scoured the internet and after quite a bit of searching, we found this prime example up for sale. A restored but unmodified 1971 TM400 Cyclone. So we quickly snapped it up and brought it home. So this right here is my bike. I own it and it just so happens to be the exact same age as my dad and our test rider, Sean. And because we own it, I have no qualms whatsoever about sending it as hard as we possibly can. Okay, so if you were to believe Suzuki, the TM400 was to be the best thing since knobbly tyres. But you guys have seen the video, title and description. You know that wasn't quite the case. So, if I can hold on for a couple of laps, and if the bike doesn't murder me before the end, next up, I'll tell you all about, oh my God, the problems. And why this bike was considered the most petrifying machine in motocross. Oh yeah, and before the end of the video, we'll also do a lap time comparison between this thing and its modern day equivalent to see how far things have come since the dangerous days of early 70s scrambling. So what was wrong? Why was the Cyclone considered to be the most vicious bike on track? Well, after the spectacular Hollywood bike launch was over, journalists and test riders had to wait a little while before they could actually get their hands on the bike which naturally allowed the hype and the speculation about how good this bike would be to grow. But once the media did get their hands on this machine, it quickly became apparent that there was something seriously wrong. I managed to find a few extracts from contemporary test rides that painted a bleak picture for excited Suzuki fans, and an even bleaker one if you already owned a Cyclone. So here are a few quotes that I found on offroad.com from a tester from 1971. By the time I had done two laps on the MX track, I knew there was something dreadfully wrong, either with me or the bike. Another quote from this offroad.com article is from an accomplished desert racer from the time, Al Wurzel. He simply said, this thing is dangerous. The feature goes on to explain the situation across the country as TM400 Cyclones started leaving dealerships and hitting the tracks. Word started getting out. This bike was hurting people. Suzuki owners were limping around, or worse, sporting plaster. Despite these, let's call them rough reviews, the TM400 continued to sell and sell well. And you've got to believe that's because Suzuki were kings of marketing at the time. So the old saying goes, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. And in 1971, Suzuki were winning, and winning a lot. They won both the 500cc and 250cc World Championship that year, with Roger DaCosta winning eight motos and five Grand Prix across the 12 round 500 season. And Joel Robert won eight out of 12 Grand Prix in the 250 championship. And as we know, Suzuki marketed the TM400 Cyclone as a damn near identical replica of Roger's works machine. And this is where the problems began. The Cyclone might have looked like a factory bike. It might have even had the ponies to match Roger's rocket. But this production version just simply didn't perform anything like the works machine. For starters, the works version was reportedly 60 pounds lighter than this cyclone that we've got right here. Roger's bike also had a stronger frame and titanium components. In order to create that catchy tagline, the TM400 was obviously built to a price point, and lower grade materials were used for a lot of the equipment. And let's be honest, that's where a lot of the problems are going to stem from. Suzuki were building their very first mass production big bore bike and they were doing it on a budget. So the main problem was that petrified power delivery. It was like a light switch. It was either on or it was off. Oh. 
This light switch style power delivery was caused by a flywheel that was just way too light. Many owners quickly figured this out and installed a heavier flywheel to try and smooth out that power curve and reduce the amount of sleepless nights caused by their cyclone. Problems with the fancy new pointless electronic ignition system also caused erratic performance issues. The system was designed to retard the ignition to make starting the bike easier and then at a certain RPM it would advance for maximum performance. It said that at around 4000 RPM the bike would go from mild retard to full advance with no graduation. It's also said that this would never happen at the exact same RPM two times in a row, resulting in a super strange and totally unpredictable power delivery. Which does sound pretty dangerous when you're operating a 40 horsepower big bore two stroke with less than optimal drum brakes. The solution here was to replace the new ignition system with the old style tech that was still used on the Suzuki Enduro bikes, meaning that the PEI system was in fact pointless. So if the power delivery was a little bit scary, at least the bike had to arrive, didn't it? Oh, <laughs> I missed the brake completely. According to reports, the mild steel chassis just wasn't up to handling the power of the bike and the terrain of the tracks at the time. Reportedly, the chassis would flex and bind up and release that energy like a spring and go off in its own direction completely unexpectedly, which was less than ideal to say the least. So upon closer inspection, the test riders found that the suspension was actually pretty poor, even for 1971. And let's be honest, all suspension was pretty bad back then. The forks and the shocks just weren't up for handling the weight and the power of the bike, and they were both notorious for fading quickly. Another annoying problem was the air filter. When new back in 1971, the bike didn't feature a foam filter like I would recognize. It had a paper filter that apparently was pretty useless if it got wet. Another problem was the foot pegs. Back in the day, I, they definitely didn't have springs in them and I don't think they even folded backwards. These have been modified, I think, by a previous owner to be able to do this movement. But because the pegs didn't move at all, potential injuries to the lower leg were quite high. If you put your leg or your foot in the wrong position in the rut, you could get caught out by this nasty little foot peg here. You can also see how small and skinny it is. To the modern eye, that looks lethal, if you ask me. As I mentioned earlier, the Cyclone sold well. So there were a lot of these things at the track and a lot of people were encountering problems or getting hurt or worse. This thing was nicknamed the Widowmaker for a reason. A small industry was soon born as concerned riders started producing replacement parts and accessories to try and improve the life or the life expectancy of Cyclone owners. From replacement flywheels and shocks to completely new frames, there were a lot of modifications you could make. But for me, sitting here in 2023, it seems absolutely wild to me that you could actually buy a completely new frame for your bike. Just imagine that today, like KTM or Honda hadn't done a very good job in their chassis R&D, so a company like Pro Circuit come along and build a better frame for you to buy after the fact. It's just absolutely astonishing to me and it kind of blows my mind a little bit. Being honest with you guys now, as I was doing my research for this video and I was reading report after report of test riders from the 70s saying how scared they were of this bike and then they go on to list all of their buddies that were maimed by the TM400, I started to get a little nervous for our first ride on the Cyclone. I had a whirlwind of butterflies wreaking havoc on my insides as we headed to the track. Right, so me and Sean, we're in the van, the bikes are loaded up. We're at the track now, and uh, the nerves are setting in, right? We're gonna ride the most dangerous dirt bike of all time. I'm actually feeling a bit anxious. I can see where the bike got its nickname as the Liquid Courage Machine was its other nickname, right? So uh, <laughs> let's take a few swigs and, up, yeah. and, give this, and give this a go. Uh, wish us luck. Okay, so it's the moment of truth then. It's time to ride the TM400 Cyclone. We're here at the awesome Conquest Valley Motorsport track. 
near Houghton Conquest in Bedfordshire. This is actually a really, really cool old school scramble track. It's been around for donkey's years. My dad actually used to race this track back in the, was it 70s dad or was it the 80s? Or oh, the 80s he said. It's been around for a long time and we thought it would be an awesome circuit to come and ride this old school scrambler. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of things I want to mention. Um, the bike, like I said earlier on in the video, does have an auto lube system. We've disconnected that and we're um, using Puteline MX-9. In the fuel, Puteline MX-9 can be used for auto lube or premix as well. So we're using that from our sponsors, Puteline. And also we're using E10 Fuel Fighter because these old bikes really do not like ethanol in the fuel. So we're using this to help with that. And um, as always, a big thank you to Puteline for supporting what we do and helping us make videos like this one. Check them out, MX-9, E10 Fuel Fighter. I'll put links in the description down below. But uh, let's get geared up, let's go riding. through my spine going up that hill oh so I've survived a ride on the TM 400 cyclone that was an experience it was wild um, I'm gonna let Sean have a go and then we'll go back into the pits um, to give this a proper review compare it to the modern bikes before we do a hot lap comparison this thing doesn't actually have a, a kill switch. Um. Jesus Christ. So we both have survived a ride on the world's most dangerous motocross bike. What were your first impressions, Sean? When we first started it, you know, we bumped it. Yeah. It literally, when it fired into life and it pinged out the ex exhaust, I was like, we've just started the devil. Obviously then, you know, we've done a few laps on it and there's a couple of things I noticed. A, I need some new kidneys, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and B, I can see why they wore kidney belts yeah. because the travel of suspension is like, Zero. Yeah. No, the foot pegs. <laughs> are you know you saying there's no no grip on those foot pegs, no, no spikes, no. nothing. They're tiny, but I actually didn't even notice the foot pegs. There were so many other things that I was worried about. The foot pegs was down at the bottom of my list of yeah. worries. The first worry, the main worry I had was stopping. Obviously, he's got these drum brakes on there, which are going to be subpar by our modern standards anyway, but casing on that side of the rear brake is huge and it just covers the rear brake pedal so if you're like sat down into a corner and you've got not great form like me and you've got little duck feet and you your feet are out like that you go to find the rear brake and it's nowhere to be found so i found if you stood up in real late into the corner you have your feet in a better position you can find it but one of the weirdest things, obviously it's such an old bike and the geometry on it is so oh, weird. Nice. Obviously it's got like that massive bench seat. We're used to getting up to like here in the corners. Yeah. So you're like sliding up the seat and then let's call it the, um, 
the pinch, shall we? <laughs> the pinch between the seat and the tank on the old danglies. Yeah, you're like, oh, Jesus, wow. Yeah. That wasn't the most enjoyable thing. Uh, there was one lap I thought, oh, I'll get myself a little bit forward here. And, I, and then I went around the corner, I was like, ooh. No, <laughs> yeah. that's not a good idea. But yeah. the, the handlebars as well were like so wide. When I, like, when I sat on it, I thought, in my head, I've just got, well, Steve McQueen. But even though it's got them big handlebars, I found it really hard to turn. When you see all these old school pictures of these racers on them and they've got the bike laid down like, and they're sitting on the edge of the seat. Now, I can understand why now, yeah. because that's how you've got to ride it to make it turn. You know, if you try to be modern day motocross and yeah. like this, and, work. you know, that it, it was just going straight. I mean, fair anything. play to those boys yeah. racing these for 35, 40 oh, minutes around places like Hawkstone in the moor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The main problems that they they had with these bikes back in the day, why they said it was so dangerous, was power delivery. Yeah. What did you feel like when you opened it up? Did you feel like it was a light switch? It surprised me. It was a lot, it was a lot faster than I expected it to be. The gears were so long. Really long, yeah. And I think it felt like that was taming it slightly. It just sounded so aggressive. But this, you could just hang it out so long. And when you did, you did feel like it did have that. Yeah. It did have the, the beans there, but I didn't feel like it was dangerous. No, no, I didn't feel like it was dangerous. All, all that's going through my mind was like, this has got five gears. This, it yeah. must it must do 90 mile an hour. Yeah, because we're not it's hitting no. fifth gear out there. I was in, I would use first and second, and I think up the hill I pulled third yeah, yeah. While, it, while it was wide open. It was the hardest bike I've ever ridden, as in like, it was so hard to understand what it what it was doing and how I could use the power and make it turn and do everything you know it took it did take a while handling wise did you feel that flex in the sh in the um, chassis that they talked about that would kind of send it off in its own direction no not because there were just ski jumps the only time I've sort of felt anything like that was up that hill when it was what? bumpy and it started and you could feel it swap when it started swapping then you could feel you know the flex of everything where there was a few times where I was like whoo that for me that was the worst motocross bike I've ever ridden. I think any bike from that yeah, it's would feel be, like that. Yeah, it's got to be, just from what yeah. we compare it to. Yeah. So you said it's um, the most difficult bike you've ever had yeah. to try and tame. Yeah, yeah. How scary were they when you were pushing it? <laughs> scary. <laughs> and the reason Sean was pushing it so much is because obviously we have to end the video with a hot lap challenge. So um, you did a hot lap on this and then you did some hot laps on your modern bike, 350 KTM. So you had to push it. Yeah. It's only fair that yeah, yeah, yeah. the old cyclone gets a fair chance at um, taking the glory. So uh, yeah, you went for it. Was, yeah. Let's find out how the cyclone compares to a modern bike. Let's see how far motocross has come in 52 years. Um, take it away, Sean. So we're about to find out how far motocross bikes have come in the past 50 years. But before we set Sean loose on track on both the Cyclone and his own 350 KTM, we first got to talk about the legacy that this mean machine left in its wake. So what was the legacy of the 1971 Suzuki TM400 Cyclone? What happened after all of those bad reviews? Did Suzuki go back and fix it all and address all of the problems? Well, no. No, they did not. Like I said, the TM400 sold well, and Suzuki didn't really seem bothered by the reviews that called it the most dangerous bike of all time. After all of the hype, the 1971 TM400 Cyclone turned out to be an utter disappointment for most and a total death trap for others. For 1972, the Cyclone literally only received aesthetic updates, going from the orange to the familiar Suzuki yellow. And the story was largely the same for the next three years, with the bike only receiving minor and mainly cosmetic updates. In that time, Roger da Costa would win four 500cc World Motocross Championships, only being bested by Heike Mikula in 1974. The man would climb back to the top of the world in 1975, which would be the last year of production for the Suzuki TM400 Cyclone. For 1976, Suzuki would introduce the iconic RM range, which in case you didn't know, stands for Racing Machine. And their reign as kings of the game would continue for another 10 years. The story of the Cyclone faded into history. History became legend, and legend became myth. 
And those are the stories that we love to dig up and retell here on 999 Laser. And I hope that you guys have really enjoyed this one. I feel very privileged to actually own this bike, which represents a super interesting slice of motocross history, especially because I don't think there are many of these things left standing, particularly ones in this condition. I would love to keep this bike forever, but you guys know how the game goes. We're always looking for space and funds for the next project. We bought this bike for this video, for this project, but I really do think it belongs in a collection. It's a unique slice of motocross history, like I said, one of the most notorious bikes of all time. So if you'd like it for your collection, it will be up for sale after this video, once we've done with this project. So if you do want to own a piece of motocross history, feel free to give me a message on Instagram. That's the best place. My Instagram is at one minute moto. If you're brave enough and you want the cyclone in your collection, drop us a message. But for now, let's find out how fast this legend is around the track. set his hot lap on board his 350 KTM which we consider to be near enough the modern day equivalent of this TM400 Cyclone so the time to beat is 1 minute and 43 seconds how close will he be let me know your guesses in the comments down below how far off do you think the Cyclone will be to its modern day equivalent but Sean big thanks to you today for coming along to ride the bike, but also all your help on the spanners, on the lead up, even this morning, getting it running. Couldn't do it without you, mate, so big thank you. Huge thanks to Dale and Malcolm from Houghton Conquest, or Conquest Valley Motorsport, to give the track its official name. An awesome place, isn't it, Sean? Especially for old scramblers. Uh, my dad used to race here back in the day. Yeah, if you ever get a chance to come ride here, yeah, definitely so come. Cool. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. <laughs> played havoc with us here on the lead up to this shoot which meant that we had to cut the track slightly to make a rideable loop just avoiding the muddy sections of the track we didn't really want to abuse this 50 year old machine too much so we just shortened the track to make it a little bit more friendly for the old cyclone there's only a handful of corners left to go though but it looks like that 350 kgm's going to take the win here that's that one minute 43 mark been and gone now there's two corners left on the track. How quickly can Sean get through these last two corners? We're about to find out. He's heading down the slick grass hill now, into the final turn. And here we go then. So it looks like the 50 year old machine is 17 seconds slower. As always guys, my name is Max. You've been watching 999 Laser. Let us know what other bikes you want to see us ride and we'll try and make it happen like we've done here because this was a suggestion from you guys in the comments. But as always, thanks for watching. We'll see you at the track.